We're going to begin now our part two of the program. And just a suggestion, if you'd like to move closer to the front of the room so that everybody can be closer to Cho. And this is going to be an interactive session. So we're hoping you have questions, many questions, about the scenarios themselves. And we might start by asking Cho to give a little more context to kick that off. Does that sound good, Cho? That sounds fine to me, yeah. OK. <coughs> so this is when an expectant hush falls on the audience. And I suddenly realize that everyone's looking at me. And there's a spotlight shining on me. And I've got to say something. Well, first, let me just, uh, I'm, I'm <coughs> this follow-up session is really because I know a number of you in the audience, maybe all of you, um, have been looking uh, with great interest, reading uh, the new scenarios that we came up with this year, Mountains and Oceans. And uh, some of you have questions about these scenarios. And may I just begin by giving you a bit of context around them. I'm not going to do a formal presentation. I, I do that in other forum, but uh, in other fora. But uh, what I'd like to do is just say briefly why we came up, what led us to develop a new set of scenarios uh, at this point in time. Now, the background was actually not 2013 when we came up with these scenarios, but 2008 uh, when we developed a set of long-term energy scenarios going out to 2050. Uh, and that was the first time in Shell, uh, in the Shell Scenarios team, uh, that we used a very detailed energy model mapping supply and demand looking out over the long term. Now, there are different issues around uh, using models of this formal kind in scenario planning. And I don't wish to go into the pros and cons of that, except to say we actually found it very, very useful in giving credibility uh, uh, in terms of having actual real data and numbers uh, 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 underlying the scenario stories themselves. Now, the scenarios focus very strictly. We wanted to focus very strictly on energy. Uh, and so we built this model around how we saw supply demand evolving uh, in two different, along two different paths. We call those paths scramble and blueprints. Uh, and then we took these numbers to a group of climate scientists at MIT. Um, and uh, we just made friends with them at the time. And we, we became uh, good friends with them over the last five years. But um, they ran our numbers through their climate model. And they told us, aha, uh -huh, you know, this scenario, you're going to get this temperature rise. That scenario, you're going to get that, and the implications, and so on. So, so far, so good. But actually, what really struck us, the real learning point from, uh, from those scenarios was, yeah, we were concerned about supply, energy supply. We were concerned about energy demand. But the third thing, the climate consequences, was what came to dominate the scenario stories. And from that, we had one inescapable conclusion, um, that um, we face a critical transition in energy terms. And this is inevitable. This will happen whether you like it or not. Now, since that time, from 2008, uh, we've seen the world move through great turbulence. And you, you, you see it all yourselves. I mean, you know, the Arab Spring, uh, increasingly people demanding more uh, from their leaders. Uh, and everywhere around the world, whether you live in a democracy or whether you live in a more authoritarian uh, regime, uh, you find that the leaders you have are less and less able to deliver what you want. That's one thing. Then, of course, what everyone talks about, the shift from west to east, which I see is an essential correction uh, from what happened in the late, what began in the late 18th century in Europe with the Industrial Revolution, which shot uh, the Western economies uh, to global prominence. And now, the secret, because it's no longer a secret, but the, 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 the understanding of how to do that has, uh, uh, has now spread. We all know how to do it, whether we're able to do it today or not. That's another question. But sooner or later, 
uh, peoples around the world will pick it up and will get on with it. So uh, this shift from west to east, we see as a fundamental rebalancing of an imbalance that had been caused you know, way back uh, in, 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 in the history of humankind. And then the third thing is, um, uh, so uh, we have uh, the shift from west to east, we have um, uh, um, uh, people demanding more, and the third thing is um, we've seen a major uh, uh, economic and financial crisis actually impact very strongly on Western developed economies. Uh, and to a large degree, uh, the developing world led by China was able to insulate itself uh, from the consequences of this crisis by spending a lot of money. Uh, and that huge financial boost, uh, a, a real Keynesian solution, enabled their economies to continue to grow and kept the global economy uh, growing, though at a rate much lower than where it had been pre-2008. Uh, but the lesson we drew from that was that's a one-off solution. We can't do it again. Uh, and there is a basic fundamental reinvention that is required in both the developed world and in the developing world if economies are going to recover and if the global economy is going to grow again. So what we did in 2008, we did something quite artificial. We focused on long-term energy, and we kept actually economic growth rates going out to 2050 in both scenarios uh, the same. Uh, and this time we said, well, look, we, introduce, we need to introduce more variability in the growth rates and uh, uh, different patterns of economic growth. So we had a slower but more steady growth rate in one scenario, we call it mountains, and a faster but more volatile, more bus and booms uh, uh, growth rate in the other scenario, we call it oceans. So we have these two scenarios which start to introduce into that energy understanding a sense of the economic dynamics. And we also try to bring in a sense of how we see geopolitics evolving. Now, you know, just now we had a bit of fun with Rich about, you know, sitting back in 1913, how much of, the how much of 20th century history could you have foreseen? Uh, uh, um, and uh, uh, my, my, my point was that certain fundamental transformations were surely foreseeable, not all, but certain ones surely were, uh, but the actual detail we cannot pick out. So we don't pretend that we can pick out the detail of what's going to happen over the course of this century, but what we can see are certain fundamental transitions, uh, transformations taking place today, and we may also expect reactions, counter-reactions against these fundamental shifts uh, that are happening. So I see Peter Schwartz sitting there, and you know, you've talked in your book, The Long View, about the undertow. You know, you have a current, you have a tide, and there's always this undertow that's building up. And the question is, when, you know, when does the turning point occur? So taking a very broad view of how humankind will move over the course of this century, we suggest uh, in one scenario, that's really our second scenario, oceans, we'll see much more uh, much uh, more active, effervescent, uh, 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 gl open globalization happening, but it'll be a globalization fed from many different sources, creating great multiple changes in the world around us, in which uh, you know successful exemplars will be readily copied. It's a fast-moving world, uh, and in the other scenario, we see a reaction. In a way, the established elites trying to keep control of the process, and people thinking, well, actually, a bit of stability, a bit of predictability in my life might not be a bad thing after all. And we see that lower, more moderate growth rate coming in, um, and uh, uh, more, uh, more of an emphasis on long-term planning, more, in, more of a role for the state uh, in industrial and economic policy. So taking these understandings and translating them into energy terms, uh, in that first scenario, we call it mountains. Uh, we have um, the big energy projects that require major investments up front actually coming to fruition. So uh, if we think about gas, uh, we call this uh, king gas replaces king coal. That's the story that we have here in mountains. It's a gas story, but gas emerging as the backbone fuel for renewables because we believe that uh, you need that backup fuel uh, if intermittent energy sources are going to play an increasing role within the global energy system, but they need that backup. 
Um, and uh, uh, also, we therefore argue if this is going to be a world of um, uh, continued extensive use of fossil fuels, such as gas, we will need technologies like carbon capture and sequestration, which require a lot of upfront investment to kick in as well and for governments to start pushing that very early on. So it's also a CCS. Mountains is also a carbon capture and sequestration story. So that's the story in mountains as far as energy is concerned. Uh, we call it a clean story because we still burn fossil fuels and we but we capture as much of the CO2 as possible from that, from the, uh, from the, uh, that's being emitted uh, through technologies like carbon capture and sequestration. Now the thing is, let's be clear, I'm talking in relative terms. So it's not that renewables doesn't take off. Renewables does. Uh, we get much uh, stronger rates, uh, we, we get much stronger growth in wind and solar and so on, but it's relatively slower than in the other scenario. And the price signal also reflects that because in the mountains world, uh, we get much more energy supply. Governments are very concerned about uh, energy security and they're very concerned to keep domestic production going. And as a consequence, given a lower rate overall of economic growth, uh, energy prices really flatten uh, and therefore it becomes that bit more difficult to bring on the renewables. Now in the alternative oceans world, which is a much more open, globalized world, uh, intense market competition, uh, what we will see is the precise opposite. So there it is, th it is uh, the, the, the new disruptive technologies that will really take shape and that, that will start to eat into the, uh, the share of energy supply that the established uh, producers uh, uh, are providing. So we'll see a really um, a big uptake very early on in renewables and the, this is helped by the price signal because as we move into this ocean's world, uh, as economic growth uh, 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 regains its earlier momentum, uh, um, as uh, energy demand, particularly in the large developing countries, continues to rise, you will see a tightening of the energy market. Uh, prices inevitably will rise and that price signal will aid uh, 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 investment and innovation in renewables and other forms of uh, new energy sources. So that is helped on that side. And the other thing about the price signal uh, is that it also pushes us to be much more efficient in the way uh, that we use energy. So we will see dramatic improvements in energy efficiency over the course of oceans. Now, we call that a green solution because of the emphasis that we give on renewables in oceans um, as, uh, 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 as, um, as uh, uh, in particular solar, uh, as a leading uh, uh, energy supply source. So we have green on the one hand in oceans, we have clean on the other hand in mountains. Now the thing is this, when we take our energy numbers to our friends at MIT, um, and they run it through their um, uh, climate model, they tell us, uh, uh, folks, not good news, because in both your scenarios, you're at between 3.3 to 4 degrees centigrade, somewhere between, depending on the scenario. And if we take, we know it's just a convenient benchmark, but if we take 2 degrees centigrade as uh, the target we need to aim for, then that simply is not good enough. So one key learning from these two scenarios is that we can't just do clean, we can't just do green, we need to use something called clean and green. That's one key learning. The second point is um, carbon neutrality because we believe that in both scenarios, uh, our energy trajectories tell us, in both of them, that by the end of the century, we will be at that carbon neutral status. The question is how much CO2 we've chucked up into the atmosphere before then because that's the critical issue. Uh, and um, therefore, we need to do everything we can. That's why the clean and green answer is the one that we're grappling with right now. C scenarios, um, you know, they're a tool. There's nothing uh, uh, mysterious uh, uh, about them. They're simply a tool to aid better decision making. And so we use these scenarios as a challenge to our management to think, well, what is it that, you know, if, where's the world going to go? Is it going more towards a clean route or towards a green route? And also, where should it be going? Because the answer 
to us from the modeling work that we do uh, and from the, uh, what the climate uh, scientist friends that we have at MIT tell us is that we need to do both. Okay, questions? Hi, uh, Martin Cornwinder. I just have a real quick question. How, how do you view uh, fracking, horizontal drilling, as a game changer for the United States uh, versus the rest of the world? My understanding is I was uh, thinking there was like 15,000 unconventional wells in the United States. The closest country to us was Canada at less than 200. Uh, I know China's got a lot of those places where they can go, but the terrain is also difficult. So uh, are we technologically so far advanced? Are we also sitting on a big pool of uh, natural gas in, in complement to you, what your strategy is gonna be here in the future? Is it really that much of a game changer? You know, I think on company strategy, you should feel that question to Marvin, who I've unfortunately has just left the room. But um, um, on the, the question about shale, shale gas in the US and elsewhere, that's a very, very interesting question. We are not certain ourselves whether what we see in the US today can be replicated elsewhere. So in our two scenarios, we have a really successful take up of shale elsewhere in the world, and China is our, uh, our leading candidate there. Uh, but it will be slower than in the US, but it will happen eventually. In the other scenario, it doesn't happen for all sorts of reasons. Now, the US, of course, as you, you, you yourself are well aware, is unique in the number of small individual entrepreneurial companies that kicked off this shale revolution. You don't see that picture. And, and of course, there, there a lot of the other supporting pieces were also in play, including appropriate legislation, which you don't see, for instance, in much of Western Europe, um, and you know, in the infrastructure and the, and, and, and the players as well. But the, the, what we see in China is a very, very different story. Now, I'm not a geologist. My understanding is that China it has very promising geology for shale. But the players involved are the big players, not the small players like, like in the US, and there are only a few of them. Now, will they learn to get the act together? You know, it's a matter of opinion. But in my view, um, the Chinese record for learning from others has been pretty good these last 15, 20 years. Uh, and I would expect you know, them to learn and to do it, uh, but it will be done in a different industry structure, in a different way from what we've seen um, in this country. So, as I said, we have two scenarios, one of which it takes off, and the other one of which it doesn't, and this has significant implications for where the global energy picture moves. Hi, Bob. Uh, maybe not. Oh, is it working? Oh, no, it's working. Yeah. Um, Bob Horn, Stanford University. Uh, Cho, you and I have had some chats about uh, politics and the we political situation over the years. Um, it strikes me that uh, in the project that I worked with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, uh, the vice presidents for government of the companies were not in the room and were not even in aware that sustainability was on their, should be on their agenda. They were there to stop, uh, basically in Washington and Brussels to stop things not to make carbon and capture and storage, not to make carbon tax or um, cap and trade possible uh, by making coalitions in, you know, of the business community, not, not the entire business community because we know that won't happen. Um, I'm wondering, if, have, have, what, you know, what learnings along those lines and I, I, is that happening in your observation in the political leaders and, and, and in the business leaders around the world? You know, what I observe is something very strange in the sense that I think over the last, well, firstly, let me say that uh, an awareness and an understanding about climate has been uh, one of the central preoccupations of the team of which I'm part of ever since the 1990s. Um, and in the 1990s, our attitude was quite straightforward in the sense that we said at that time, and we're winding back, you know, uh, 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 good many, a couple of decades, uh, we said um, the science is not uh, hard, but the consequences are so profound that if we don't take this seriously, 
uh, we could well be in serious trouble. Uh, our position today is uh, very straightforward in that we fully accept the, the science behind uh, our understanding on climate uh, and the consequences are profound and we better take this seriously or else we'll be in a difficult position. So that is the attitude we take. Um, and um, the, my job actually, my task, is to look out at the wider world. And as I said, I see something very strange going on in the sense that over the last four or five years, climate scientists, the climate science, climate science itself seems to be hardening. I think climate scientists are much more sure uh, of what is going to happen. And they express this in terms of probabilities, but the probabilities are tightening. On the other hand, public attention seems to be moving in the opposite direction. So it's a bit like two ships passing in the middle of the night uh, and not meeting. And the problem that we have today is reversing that other ship and getting it to move back to uh, 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 where uh, the scientists and our understanding of the subject uh, is today. Um, and one thing that uh, I do believe as a political scientist is that political leaders by and large are only able to act and this applies as much to autocracies as well as to democracies, because even in autocracies, you can act against your people, but that's very short term. You will be toppled at some point. It's just much more abrupt than in a, than in a democracy. Um, but th the point is, political leaders are only able to act when there is a sense amongst their peoples of a need for action. So when we look at uh, action on climate change and we call on our political leaders to act, which is the, the, the point of your question, I think we also need to ask what will cause that turnaround, that shift in public opinion. That's a critical dilemma. That's the issue we face today. Uh, Philip Larson, miscellaneous entrepreneur. Uh, I was involved in uh, nuclear waste reprocessing a little bit when, you know, Carter prohibited it, uh, the reprocessing and uh, nuclear lost some of its efficiency, but it's still the least polluting form of energy we have. Do you see any of that coming back as a popular source? Nuc nu uh, nuclear, plays, nuclear plays a big role in our mountain scenario. Um, we, I, I put a lot of emphasis uh, in mountains on gas, but basically big large scale projects um, of of which nuclear, you know, nu the nuclear industry is part of that game, this will have a prominent role to play. So my personal view is uh, we need every game in town. Uh, there is no one silver bullet that will uh, uh, resolve the issues around energy long term, and nuclear has, a, has a, a significant and important role to play in that mix. And it's reflected in our scenario. This is David Rummler. I'm at Stanford, also Clean Tech Strategy Group. Um, the Chinese have, have uh, used a, a method of, of uh, developing their, their resources and, and implementing in their resources, like in, in electric vehicles, they, they've used this, they, they experiment around the country, different ways and, you know, market mechanisms. And, and they've used that, I don't know what they, they're using in, in, uh, in, in the exploration area, but uh, in this country it took some 50 to 60 years for shale gas to be, come to fruition where it is today. Do you have any sense or feel for how they're going to be successful in doing that? Are they going to use this experimentation method? Is it going to take a long time, et cetera? Well, as you know, I mean, the Chinese method has been uh, one of, of, of pragmatism. You know, what was Teng Xiaoping's famous phrase, you cross the river by feeding for the stones. So they will operate that way. That's what I believe. That's what they used to. But the, at the end of the day, we need fundamental change in energy systems around the world. Now, I'll just pick up your point about the U.S. It's not for me to tell you about the U.S. You know this country a lot better than I do. But what it, I do feel is that the U.S. has a huge capacity to surprise. So, for instance, it can be very, very slow. Uh, but disrupt disruptive technologies, when they emerge, uh, more often than not, come from this part of the world. So uh, I hold out a lot of hope for things really taking place uh, and things really moving forwards uh, in the U.S., uh, but the future's all to be played for. Now, the Chinese are also de developing very efficient co uh, coal burning technologies. And, and Duke Energy, which is the largest energy company in this country, is over there learning from them and bringing that stuff back here. So it's to say that gas is going to be totally replaced is not necessarily the case, as, as I understand it. 
Well, you know, as I said earlier, I think we need every energy source that we that uh, uh, that's around that's uh, to our, available to us uh, to use. Um, should I take just one more question, Karen? Okay, just one more, please. Um, no. Okay, then. Oh well. Yeah, one more okay. here. Uh, Charles Barnhart, postdoctoral scholar, Stanford University. Um, I've heard several metaphors with respect to natural gas. It's the backbone for a renewable future. It's the bridge to the renewable future. Yeah. Um, because they can supplement the intermittent supply from renewable resources. But as I'm sure you're well aware, there are other techniques and technologies that provide grid flexibility, like energy storage, uh, excess capacity, transmission, uh, smart grid technologies. Yeah. Did you account for these in your uh, scenario modeling? And if not, would no, absolutely. are there other yeah. metaphors like a stumbling block? No, absolutely. We, we, do, we do build in uh, improvements in technologies in all these different areas. And as far as we, a lot of renewables are concerned, the storage problem is for us a critical one. Uh, and if you can crack that, uh, you can solve a lot to get renewables moving forwards much more quickly. So there are these blockers in the system, which we are look to the technologists uh, to get a handle on uh, and to break the problem apart and to enable us to move forward. But we do actually anticipate and we build in quite significant uh, uh, improvements in technology that will allow renewables to really take off at, uh, uh, at huge multiples of where we are today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cho. Thanks to our audience. Thank you to Shell for making this possible. And hope to see you very soon. Have a great day. Oh, one more thing. If you did not, pick up your copy of the New Lens Scenario book, simply write the word yes on the back of your business card and drop it off at the registration table and they will ensure that you do receive a copy of the New Lens Scenarios. Have a great day. Thank you.